The Tom Woods Show, episode 1935. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Start your day like a true Tom Woods Show listener with the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee. They've got a wide variety of mouth-watering roasts, and it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. Take 20% off your first order at PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods and use promo code Woods at checkout. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Our old friend Eric Brakey is back with us on the show today. He's a former state senator from Maine. He's now with Young Americans for Liberty, and he is going to make the case for liberty optimism, which is a case, well, sometimes we need to hear made. I'll play a little devil's advocate here, and I think we're going to have some fun. Eric, welcome back. Hey, Tom. So glad to be with you. It was good seeing you recently at the Porcupine Freedom Festival. That was a great, great time. And it was my pleasure to be one of the judges for the Soapbox Idol Contest, in which people get up on a soapbox and they rant and rave about whatever's on their mind. And you were one of the participants and you were one of the three finalists and your message resonated very much with that audience. And it was a message of optimism about why we have reason to be optimistic, given that there is, as you know, a very substantial strain of pessimism running through our movement. And the thing is, I can understand and appreciate the case both ways, honestly, but can you start off by making the kind of case that you tried to make in that brief pitch? Well, certainly. And Tom, it was really fun having you there as a judge. I appreciated you to announce to everyone that you're not going to be biased in my case since you knew me personally. But uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, that was a lot of fun and good hearing from a lot of great folks. But yeah, the, so the case I was making there, which you know I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about today is, you know, I, I've been in the liberty movement now for 10 years And throughout all this time, I always hear so much pessimism about where we are and how bad things are, and it's always going to get worse. And this is such a defeatist attitude. I feel like we can always look at the glass half full or half empty. It's a matter of perspective. But I think that sometimes we undercut the real significant victories that we've had over the last 10 years. You know, I remember when Ron Paul retired from Congress after the 2012 presidential campaign and Everyone was always, you know, asking him, what should I do? How can I be a, you know, make a difference in this movement? And Ron Paul, certainly no central planner. He said, I don't know. You've got to figure it out. There's something out there for you. And in the 10 years since then, I think so many people have kind of taken that and said, okay, I got to figure it out. I got to do something. And Ron Paul supporters have done amazing things over the last 10 years. Now we have hundreds of Ron Paul supporters elected to state legislatures across the country. We have uh, folks challenging the financial system through alternative cryptocurrencies. But I want to focus on just like three issues here, which I think are really kind of foundational issues. You know, issues that, you know, if we're going to defeat the Washington machine, these are kind of the three keystones as I see it. And that's money, guns, and war. And the right to keep and bear arms, the right to protect our, ourselves and our property. We've made tremendous strides on that. I remember 10 years ago, you know, we can look at constitutional carry, the progress of constitutional carry laws across the country. 10 years ago, this was considered a marginal fringe issue. And it was really the Ron Paul movement that adopted it. I remember Campaign for Liberty was an early, you know, uh, fighter for this. And, uh, you know, today we've gone from just 10 years ago, where maybe there were two or three or four states with this fringe policy, to now 25% of all Americans in 21 states now live in constitutional carry states where the legal restrictions to the right to keep and bear arms are um, easier to access the right to keep and bear arms than ever before. You know, Ron Paul told folks, we've got to, you know, end the Fed and challenge the Federal Reserve monopoly. And so many folks went out there, they became early adopters of cryptocurrency. And now people are starting to wonder, professional economists are starting to wonder if this competing currency may actually you know, become a challenge to the dollar's global reserve status. And you know, on the issues of you know, war, which of course we all know Murray Rothbard said is the, the health of the state, I mean, sentiments have turned so strongly against forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and across the world that even now that Joe Biden is president, who's been a warmonger his entire career, 
even he is feeling the pressure to the point where we're actually getting out of Afghanistan. And the, the formerly neoconservative Republican Party is now the anti-war party, something we could never have imagined 10 years ago. And these are all the seeds planted by the Ron Paul movement over the last 10 years. So while there are so many other issues that are certainly important, you know, certainly the lockdowns and whatever various government agencies are doing against our liberties are important. If we protect the right to keep and bear arms, if we can defeat the dollar monopoly and we can undermine the war machine, those three issues will, uh, you know, really strike at the the whole basis of the of the empire. All right. I agree with you about all those things. And I also agree that sometimes because we're focused on the minutia of the day, we don't step back and look at the bigger perspective of where we've come in the course of 10 years. So I agree with you on that. But where would be the fun if I didn't push back a little? You know, there'd be no fun. So let me do that a little bit. On the three issues you're talking about, I agree with you. I I think it would also be hard for them to, not impossible, but just the the zeal for another war is just not there among the public. Mm -hmm. I just don't see them being able to gin one up. So these are all good things. You're right. But I don't think we can just gloss over the last 18 months. I mean, all over the world, there was a policy introduced that was inhuman, and you couldn't even dissent from it. And if you dissented from it, sometimes you got deplatformed, you were called crazy. Then six months later, they'd say, well, yeah, you were right about that, but everybody knows that. Well, no, everybody only knows it because I tried to say it six months ago. It's the most dystopian moment of our lives. And we still have Canada under unbelievable restrictions. The UK... Boris Johnson says we're going to reopen. People are screaming to be locked back up, screaming for it. But we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, there certainly are a lot of people across the world, you know, living, including in our own country, living with Stockholm Syndrome. They've come to identify with their oppressors, and they think that the more that their oppressors deprive them of their liberties, the more they're doing for them. I mean, our founders would certainly be ashamed. But of course, you know, so many of these institutions, while certainly having the tacit you know, support of so many people helps them. But one, I, and this is a point I, I made at Porkfest, I think part of the reason why we are seeing you know, governments, particularly the US governments, the reason we're seeing you know, spy agencies like the FBI and the NSA get so involved explicitly in politics and pushing so many of these policies outwardly is because they can sense that they're losing control of the narrative. They've had to crack down on the American public and just the world more than we've seen, uh, certainly in recent memory, because they're getting desperate. You know, in the era of the internet where information has been so freely available, free speech, you know, the average individual person, their right to free speech can, you know, extend, you know, much more widely across the world than ever before. They can't rely on these kind of these old ways to control the narratives that they've used to, you know, kind of govern society. And so, yeah, they've used a very heavy hand over the recent years, but I see that as a sign of their own desperation. And, you know, sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. But I remember something, you know, there's this very failed um, celebrity ghostwriter named Michael Malice, who said uh, <laughs> recently on Twitter, he said, you know, some people only, they reject, you know, every kind of plan that isn't an immediate silver bullet. But we need to understand that Rarely do you get a silver bullet, you know, solution to something. What happens is you win gradually and then all at once. And I would say, while we can see all of these negative things that happened the last 10 years on the foundational level, we've been winning gradually. And there's going to come a point in time, I think, where <laughs> perhaps it's in the next financial crisis, it's going to appear that we've been winning all along. We can't always see it right when we're kind of building towards that point, but with the hundreds of liberty legislators elected across the country, you know, fighting against the, the Washington machine from the state capitals, with those who are opting out of the financial system, moving towards competing currencies, I think we're really laying the groundwork for something big here. If you were in attendance at my Portfest talk, I don't know if you were, but I pointed out in that and then in a recent episode of my podcast and then even in my newsletter, a point that I think you'll appreciate and that is important for people in the community concerned about COVID, those of us who are very opposed to the lockdowns. 
I said, there are two people in public life who have been the best on this. And in the Senate, it's Rand, Paul. And in the House, it's Thomas Massey. There's no denying this. Uh, They've been absolutely outstanding. And they have held Fauci's feet to the fire. They have defied the narrative consistently and courageously. Now, what do they both have in common? They both came out of the Ron Paul movement. Now, obviously, Rand Paul, you know, came literally out of the Paul household. (laughs) But the two of them came out of something that no one saw coming. No one could have predicted there would be this Ron Paul movement. They are permanent fixtures of that Ron Paul movement in public life. And even though we are establishment unapproved, nevertheless, we have these two people who have played this very significant role. And I am convinced that much of the abandonment of masks almost overnight across the country. I can't prove this, but I have a a strong feeling that it had to do with Rand insisting that the messaging made no darn sense, that Fauci shows up with two masks on to speak to the U.S. Senate, and he's been vaccinated. And so Rand demands to know how this makes any sense. Why are you still wearing two masks? You look ridiculous. What's going on here? And suddenly it was, oh, yeah, you know what? You don't have to wear masks if you're vaccinated. So he kept pounding away at this. And I think they realized that the messaging made no sense and was undermining their vaccination efforts. And so suddenly that was gone. So this is something on behalf of your line of argument that, yes, obviously we saw something catastrophic, but two vastly disproportionately influential voices were unapproved, non-establishment, despised within Washington voices yeah. that nevertheless have had an outsized impact. Yeah. I've long believed, and I think we're seeing it happen, that we could not always predict back in 2008 and 2012, the seeds that were being planted in those Ron Paul campaigns, the seeds of liberty being planted in people's minds and hearts across the country, what those would grow into over time. This is a very long-term effort. You know, Ron Paul said, you know, campaigns are short-term affairs, revolutions are long-term projects. And we're still engaged in that long-term project. And we can see, you know, the most visible, yeah, and you're right, like Rand and Massey are two of the most visible champions who grew out of those campaigns who would not be here if it wasn't for, you know, the Ron Paul revolution in 2008 and 2012. And that very same thing is being replicated maybe to a, a less visible degree, but also I think also in some cases to a more profound degree, you know, in the state legislatures across the country. Of course, I ran for, I've served in the, my own state legislature in Maine. I've run for federal office. But, you know, when I was in the state legislature, there weren't very many of us. The people we saw were the Rands and the Masseys in Washington, D.C. And it seemed like if you wanted to make a difference in a political level for liberty, that's where you need to go. But now that we've got hundreds of folks elected like Rand and Massey, but on the state level, you know, many of whom have copies of Tom Wood's nullification, you know, on their bookshelves and are asking themselves, How can we employ these tactics to undermine this federal monstrosity? It is accessible now to so many people in the liberty movement to just go help folks run for their state legislature or run yourself. And you could undermine the Fauci's in your own state, which every state has their own Fauci through this crisis who need to be challenged in the same ways that Rand challenged uh, Fauci on the federal level. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our amazing sponsor, the official coffee of the Tom Woods Show, Press House Coffee, the coffee that turned me into a coffee drinker. It's so delicious, all the different flavors. You know my favorites are key lime pie and blueberry muffin, absolutely great. They'll also give you the best cup of diner-style coffee you ever had. Their mission is to make it as easy as possible to enjoy the best cup of coffee you've ever had. They've got an ever-evolving selection of premium roasted-to-order coffees that offer something for everyone, from rich chocolatey and nutty dark roasts to fruity and vibrant light roasts. The hardest part is just deciding which mouth-watering roast to try. Until now, Press House now has a dead simple coffee quiz that takes seconds to complete and consists of just four simple questions that anyone can answer. And your answers tell head roaster Paulie how acidic, sweet, earthy, or savory your favorite coffees will be, allowing him to hand select four coffees just for you. Go to PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods to take the quiz and be sure to use promo code Woods at checkout for 20% off your first order. So the quiz at PressHouseCoffee.com slash Woods and use promo code Woods to take 20% off your first order. Here's something, I'm not really sure where I'm going with it, but I'm just thinking out loud. Sometimes it's hard to know the long-term effects of 
something like, for example, the internet. Now the internet came along and it was the most liberating thing of all time because any opinion you had could in principle be listened to and acted upon anywhere in the world, anywhere where there was an internet connection available. And you could send your thoughts to the ends of the earth. And for the most part, you can still do that. Although as we've seen, there's been pushback and people get deplatformed. And, and so we're in a kind of a transition phase where I think there is going to be a backlash against this. I think we will build up infrastructure that will protect people against this, but I think it's in a transition period right now. But we're still, even though we've taken one step back, the internet represented the proverbial two steps forward. We're still ahead of where we were 30 years ago, without a doubt. But then on the other hand, I wonder, had it not been for the internet, would it have been possible for this COVID craziness to have gone to the extent mm -hmm. that it did? Because it wouldn't have been possible for everybody to work from home. It wouldn't have been possible for everybody to do school from home. It would have been harder to build up a global stampede against dissident voices. Mm. So, you know, even a, a favorable development can backfire. And I'm not even sure this is directly to your point or to our topic, but this was on my mind recently that I, I couldn't make my living without the Internet. It means everything to me. But at the same time, it, it could have played a very helpful role if we had sane individuals in the world. It could have played a very helpful role coordinating the response to COVID. But instead, it was like it was weaponized against us in a way. Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, every kind of new development is potentially a double-edged sword. You know, even cryptocurrencies can be argued that these are tools that can be used to fight oppression. But I'm sure, you know, national governments are going to try to develop their own kind of centralized cryptocurrencies. They already are. I think it kind of defeats the point of the <laughs> decentralization that people are looking for. Yeah, but right. certainly, every new development, this is the constant struggle, right, in all of human civilization is, you know, those who want power and those who want liberty. And just because we managed to defeat them on one front doesn't mean those who seek power are going to retreat and never come back. This is going to be a struggle through all of human history. But I mean, specifically with the internet, though, I guess the question is, in the big picture, yeah, I certainly do think uh, you make a good point that it, it certainly empowered the uh, power seekers to, uh, you know, do things that they wouldn't have been capable to do before. But at the same time, you know, I, I think of the old days when there were just like three networks or even the more recently old days where there were just a few big cable news networks telling us kind of these very limited narratives. And who could ever hear from someone like a Tom Woods, you know, putting out all the graphs of all the data, letting us know that yeah. this doesn't these narratives don't make sense. And so, you know, as much as they can try to weaponize these tools of, you know, information decentralization against us. At the same time, you know, I think the benefit for kind of dissident voices like you and me to get out there are uh, probably, I would say, on the, on the whole, I, I think, you know, it's given us a very important tool that we didn't have in the past. Yeah, I think that's a very Michael Malice kind of point you just made, because that's the kind of corrective he would give me if I were talking about all my disappointment about the situation. I think that's the kind of response I would get. Now, tell me exactly what your role is at Young Americans for Liberty. Yeah, I'm the senior spokesperson for Young Americans for Liberty. So I'm doing a lot of the, you know, writing op-eds and engaging with the media and kind of getting the good news out about all the things that are happening over here from recent policy victories that we've had, passing constitutional carry in states like Texas and Montana to huge advances in school choice that have happened We've been, you know, mobilizing our army of young liberty activists from our 500 chapters of college campuses across the country. We've been mobilizing them to get principled Ron Paul style legislators elected in election season and then also turning around in legislative season, holding all the politicians accountable, including the ones, you know, that we like and really, you know, using kind of grassroots energy to put the screws to politicians to pass, you know, good liberty policy and defeat, you know, bad policy. So I'll tell you, there was never anything like this in all the years that I was, you know, toiling away in the state Senate by myself. You know, now there's this huge network of legislators across the states who can kind of work with each other and just a huge conduit for liberty activism to make a real difference at the state level. All right. Well, that's all 
excellent news, and I'm glad to hear that you're doing that, and I think you are an excellent spokesman for this. But this means that you're in contact, of course, with a lot of young Americans. You know, you've got all these uh, campus chapters across the country. The trouble is, it seems to me that every time I read about a poll among young Americans, it's the results are pretty depressing. Like, I don't know if it was 75% of them view capitalism unfavorably. It's hard to put a positive spin on that. Well, you know, here's the thing. I mean, even polls can be kind of deceptive. And I certainly do think, you know, when it comes to uh, maybe the millennials and Gen Z generation, maybe this word capitalism doesn't resonate with them. But then again, you kind of wonder, do people really understand what capitalism is? Do, you know, you ask a lot of these same people, what do they think of free enterprise? And free enterprise, you know, polls a lot better with people. I think sometimes these words come with a bunch of connotations that we don't necessarily mean or imply. You know, a lot of people, when they hear capitalism, they think of this kind of form of crony capitalism or corporatism, as Ron Paul would call it. And they think that, you know, I'd call it kind of corporate socialism. I don't think it really resembles capitalism, but this is what a lot of people think of. They think of capitalism as bank bailouts and and the corporations getting all this stuff from the government. You and I know that that's not true, but that's what a lot of people have come to think of capitalism as. So I think that we need to, you know, when it comes to outreach to the, you know, younger generation, we need to really focus on the underlying principles and if people get hung up on this word or that word, you know, that's something we got to meet the audience where they are. All right, fair enough. Now let me ask you to play devil's advocate yourself here. What do you think is the strongest argument the pessimists have? Mm. And is it one that you can answer? So the strongest argument the pessimists would have, hmm. I mean, I would say the strongest argument, <laughs> I think, is seeing that, you know, the federal government and kind of these, these government institutions have certainly wielded kind of dictatorial power, unelected power in many cases in terms of some of these, you know, these spy agencies and stuff that they've gotten away with, you know, over the recent years to a degree that I don't know that we've ever seen before. It has never really happened in American history. But I guess what I would um, counter by saying that at the same time, because <laughs> because of this, so many people are kind of seeing it for the first time, seeing what's going on with these institutions. And for the first time, I mean, I don't remember Republicans generally ever being critical of the FBI and the CIA and the NSA to the way that they are today. I've met so many people who are kind of, well, at the one hand, we see all these friends and people we know who are all about the lockdowns. At the same time, I met so many people at Porkfest who were just recently converts to the liberty movement because of the lockdown. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The more that these government institutions have to act against the American people to kind of crack down on dissent, the more there's going to be blowback against that. What do you recommend that the average listener of this episode now go and do? Obviously, Young Americans for Liberty is a great organization, but it caters to college students. Yeah. So what do you want people to do? So I guess I would say this. First of all, of course, there's many different paths to promote liberty in our times. You know, I've gone down the political path. Some other people have gone down the, you know, focused on cryptocurrencies and other things. But if you're interested in the political path, if you're interested in trying to make a practical impact on the political path, then I would say, one, look at who your state representative is. Ask yourself, are they doing a good job? Do they represent you? If they don't, maybe ask yourself, maybe you should run for state representative. And if you can't do that, look for someone in your district who can or help those who can. There is a revolution taking place in this country right now at the grassroots state level. You know, And 2022, I, I expect we're going to build on the huge successes we had in 2020 of electing, you know, Ron Paul style liberty legislators. And we just need quality candidates because we got the we've got the resources, we've got the activist army to help people get elected by uh, taking the fight door to door across the country. What's the website? Our website is yaliberty.org. Okay, I'll link to that. This is I have a bad short term memory. Episode 1935. Yes. Yeah, so Tomwoods.com slash 1935. All right. Anything else you want to add on this that I didn't give you an opportunity to say? No, Tom, just it's a pleasure talking with you. It was great talking with you and meeting your uh, your significant other, talking with her at Porkfest. And 
I wish you all the best and looking forward to episode 2000 and everything you got going on there. Thank you very much. I, I hope uh, it'd be great to see you there. But in the short run, I'll see you at the sold out Young Americans for Liberty event in early August, which I'm also looking forward to. So thanks very much. Pleasure's all mine, Tom. All right, folks, next week, got some pretty fun episodes coming up. Now, Monday, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I got Andrew Heaton, the great comedian and libertarian, coming back on to talk about his brand new collection of poems called Los Angeles is Hideous. Now, all you Los Angeles people, don't you get defensive. We're going to have some fun with this thing. But then on Tuesday, we've got Patrick Moore, formerly of Greenpeace, helped to found the organization. And he is going to join us once again to talk about his brand new book, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom. And it's so good. It's so good. We had a great conversation. Lots more fun stuff coming up next week. So make sure you subscribe to the show. And if you like and appreciate what's going on here, you belong inside the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is where the cream of the crop are to be found. And you get many goodies for doing so. So check that out over at supportinglisteners.com. And I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.